heart we give thanks to the Holy One. We give thanks because He's given Jesus Christ His Son. Lift your voice with me. Come on. And now let the weak say, I am strong. Let the poor say, I am rich because of what the Lord has done for us. And now, let the weak say, I am strong. Let the poor say, I am rich because of what the Lord has done. With hands uplifted, we give thanks. With a grateful heart, we give thanks. To the Holy One, we give thanks. Because you've given Jesus Christ, your sweet Son, we give thanks. With a grateful heart, we give thanks to the Holy One. We give thanks because you've given Jesus Christ, your blessed Son. And now, let the weak say, I am strong. You let the poor say, I am because of what the Lord has done for us and now let the weak say I am strong and let the poor say I am because of what the Lord has done for we give thanks and we come tonight in Jesus most blessed and mighty name Father touch our lives one more time touch our hearts one more time quicken our minds one more time quicken our bodies one more time heal everyone in this studio tonight let this be a night of miracles throughout the world let this be a day of miracles for those watching on the internet, for those watching on Love World, for those watching all over the world. In Jesus' wonderful name, lift your hands and praise Him, saints. Thank Him now for what He's about to do in your life. Audibly praise Him, audibly praise Him, audibly praise Him, audibly thank Him for what He's about to do with you. Blessed be the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. Blessed be the Lord Almighty who reigns forevermore. Blessed be the Lord, Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Blessed be the Lord, God Almighty, who reigns. in heaven how we love you we lift your name in all may your kingdom be established in your presence 
as your people declare your mighty word. Blessed be.
Jesus. Name above all names. And you are Lord. Beautiful Savior. Sweet Savior. Lift your hands and just love him say. beyond descriptions to marvelous forwards to marvelous to wonderful for comprehension nothing ever seen or heard as nothing ever seen Who can grasp your infinite wisdom? Who can fathom, Lord? Who can fathom the depth of your love? You are beautiful beyond description. 
Majesty and throne. Majesty in throne. I stand in awe. I stand. I stand. I stand. I stand. Holy God. our lives tonight empower our lives tonight fill us to overflowing send us out strong in the spirit in your holy name Jesus in your blessed name Jesus Give you all the praise. Just your hands and thank him for your his love, for his mercy on your life, for his compassion. They'll never change. The world will change. Situations will change. Conditions will change. You will change. He never changes. He declared, I am the Lord, I change not. He's the same yesterday, today and forever. The same Jesus you read about in the Bible. He's still the same, loving, merciful, wonderful, precious Jesus. The same Jesus who said to that woman, Neither do I condemn thee, go and sin no more, when they were about to stone her. The same Jesus who said, come unto me, all you who labor, and are heavy laden, I will give you rest. He has not changed. The same Jesus who was moved with compassion on the multitude and healed all their sick, he has not changed. The same Jesus who on the cross cried, Father, forgive them, they know not what they're doing. He has not changed. The same Jesus who said, I am with you always, even to the end, has not changed. Lift your hands and thank him that he never changes. Never changes. Open our eyes, Lord, that we might see Jesus. Please, Lord, give us a new vision of your love. Give us a new understanding of your love. We'll never fully understand it, I know that. But, Lord, as much as possible, allow us to understand it. But you gave that revelation to Paul the Apostle who declared, I'm persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height or depth or any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God. It says in Christ Jesus, give us that revelation. In Jesus' mighty name. Ask him for that. Ask him for that. Thank you, Lord. Open our eyes, Lord. We want to see Jesus. Open our eyes, Lord. Child and touch him 
and tell him we love him. Open our ears, Lord, and help us to listen. Open our eyes, Lord. Open our eyes, we want to see Jesus, to reach out and touch Him, to reach out and touch Him, and say that we love Him, and say that we love Him. Open our ears, Lord, open our ears. And help us to listen. Open our eyes. Open our eyes, Lord. We want to see Jesus. And God's people said, Amen. 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 Before you take your seats, look at someone and say, he's coming soon. Get ready. And then you may be seated. The Lord is risen. No, you're not responding right. The Lord is risen. He's risen what? The Lord is risen. He is risen indeed. That was the greeting of the early church. In the Greek, they'd say, Christos Anesti, the Lord is risen. So one more time, the Lord is risen? Someone understood what I said in Greek? Who? Christos Anesti. Wait, 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 stand up and respond. So you speak Greek? You don't. Well, you knew that one. Armenian. Wow. So when I say Christos Anesti, you say what? Alitos Anesti. Ah, he's risen indeed. She said that in Greek. Very good. For an Armenian. My mom is Armenian. Oh, didn't you know? How many Armenians are around here? Well, all the Armenians stand up. Come on, guys. Well, are you Armenian? Okay, so where do you live, guys? Oh, Glen. Well, that's where the Ar all the Armenians live. Oh, up there, too. Oh, there you go. Glendale, too, guys. Yeah, my mom is Armenian. My, gra my mom's father uh, uh, left, uh, or I should say escaped, the genocide. Yeah, we're, our family's name was Gozian. All the Yans, you know. Every Armenian has a Yan at the end, I guess. <laughs> right, guys? So what's your names? No, last name. La huh? Okay, there's a Yan there, and there's a Yan here somewhere. Say, wow. Well, God bless the, the Armenians. <laughs> Say amen. <laughs> yeah, my, my mother, her grandfather. You people know about the genocide. Anybody knows what I'm talking about? Yeah. yeah. The Turks killed a lot of Armenians. And, they, and my, my great-grandfather uh, fled. He ran away from the Turks. And he walked all the way to Beirut, Lebanon. Uh, well, you know, a lot of them did. Back then, they, they didn't have transportation. They just walked or ran. And uh, he got to Beirut, and then they came to what was then Palestine. So there's a lot of Armenians in our part of the world. And then my mom married my dad, who was from the Greek. So Greek and Armenians married together. And then I came. <laughs> not, a, not a bad combination. So I grew, up, I grew up in the Greek Orthodox Church. Why you say, oh? You, what did you, 
Where, where do you think this face came from, lady? <laughs> well, I'm not. Why, why the O, the O, the O? Stand up, stand up, darling. Oh, you didn't know that. No, you are, you are Armenian and Greek Orthodox? Yes, ma'am. You had the roots in you from your parents. Well, of course. Hey, listen, listen, darling. Come here, come here. Where are you from? Los Angeles. Los Angeles. But I mean, <laughs> but, <laughs> but let's go back. Let's go back. You're like your family. Like, because I saw your face. Oh, oh, like, I'm not sure why you did that. But so, but your, your family came from where? Germany. Oh, Germany. Oh, Scotland. Oh, Scotland. It's okay, you came, so your background is German and Scottish or something. What are you so amazed by the fact I'm Armenian and Greek? What did you think I was? Indian? <laughs> they, they always thought I was from India. When I was in India, they all thought I was Indian. I don't know why, but it's my face, I have no idea. Yeah, actually, my name, Benny, was given to me by the patriarch of Jerusalem. He, he, he was called Benedictus. And he, he baptized me and gave me his name. So my real name is Benedictus. It's not Benny. But no, 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 no. Nobody can say Benedictus, you know? Like Benedictus for benediction. Same word, yeah? So don't call me Benedictus now, okay? <laughs> but in my passport, it says Benedictus. That's what it says, because that's my legal name. So I took Benny, you know, because it's much easier to say Benny rather than Benedictus. I miss, my, I miss my parents. I miss my upbringing. I had the most beautiful childhood. Uh, and I was an altar boy in church. This would be a very he great week for us in the Greek Orthodox Church. I was the only... Now, she would know what I'm talking about. You guys probably would have no clue what I'm about to say. I was the only kid in all Israel that used, used to go and get the holy fire with my father. She, she just gave me a look. You know what I mean by that? Not really. Who knows about the holy fire? Nobody knows about the holy fire? Where have you been? You do? Anybody knows about the holy fire? Okay. What, what is it? You don't know what the holy fire is? Okay, I can tell you. It may be real, it may be not real. I have no idea. But supposedly on the Saturday, which will be next week, not, not this weekend. They celebrate Easter next weekend in the Eastern churches. And exactly at 1 p.m. out of the tomb of Jesus in the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, the fire comes out of the tomb. It's happened every year for generations. Some call it mystical. Some say it's something else. Nobody knows. But the patriarch of the Greek Orthodox Church goes into the tomb of, of, of the Lord and they strip him, of, make sure he has no matches with him, no nothing, put a white robe on him. He goes in and comes out with the candles lit up. Whether it's true or not, I don't know. But the, the, uh, the, all the committees of the Greek Orthodox Church would go every year on Saturday. The history, if I can give you a little history, I don't want to waste your time, but pre-67, the border between Jordan and Israel was a gate called Mendelbaum Gate. The city of Jerusalem was divided pre-67. So anyone living in Israel could not go to see Jerusalem except once a year at Christmas time. And only Christians were allowed. So we were allowed to go see my grandma and my grandpapa and all the family who lived in Ramallah at the time. All the, all the Armenians left in 48 and went to Ramallah. So my precious mom would take us kids and go see her family only once a year for three days. But once a year, they would have the holy fire and they would allow, the officials, the military would allow the churches to get together at a place called Mendelbaum Gate and, and get the fire and spread to every, every church. So they would go pick it up from the border and go to all the churches and light up all the candles and all the, for a whole year. I was the only kid in the group. So one day when I got saved, a man named uh, Van der Hooven, who was the first uh, keeper of the, of the garden tomb, William uh, Van der Hooven, I think was his name, he was from Holland, he prophesied over me. 
He said, as you took the fire out of the tomb, one day God will use you to take the real fire to the world. Well, it's happened. So, I have a lot of history. I'm from Israel. That's where I get the accent from, dear Lord. Yay! You know, I grew up in the Holy Land and did not know how holy it was. No, because none of us... <laughs> I, had a, I had a fight with a kid in school about Jesus being Jewish. I thought Jesus was Catholic. <laughs> I'm not kidding you. We had a fight in, 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 in school. You're looking at me a little weird. The Catholic Church never told us that Jesus was a Jew. Never. Not one time did we hear from any of the Catholic nuns who brought me up and then the monks, Franciscans. You know the Franciscans, right? Okay. St. Francis, you know about the sort of St. Francis? The Franciscans brought me up. That's why I believed in poverty when I was a kid. They, they tried to, conv to convince me that all of us ought to live like, like you know, St. Francis. And all the Franciscan monks wore a brown uh, robe and sandals. They whipped a tar out of me. They scared us to death, those men. When we saw them, we froze. When the principal walked in, who, and they were all French from France. When they walked in, we all stood up and said, bonjour. And, all, and I spoke fluent French when, when I was a kid. I don't anymore. But anyways, these these monks, and before that, the nuns, before I was 10, I went to the nuns because I was too young for the monks. Every morning we had to kneel on Jerusalem Rock and say the creed and the Lord's Prayer and Hail Mary. Very religious upbringing. And every Sunday I'd go to the Greek Orthodox Church. Every morning we had to go to Mass in school. That was like mandatory. And on Sunday I was the altar boy, and I'd walk behind the priest, and he'd be with his censor going, Kyrie eleison, Kyrie eleison, Kyrie eleison, and me, <coughs> I'm, I was almost dying back there when all that frankincense was getting in my lungs. But that was my, uh, my upbringing. Then I got saved, and my mom and dad thought I would lost my mind. My father took me to a psychiatrist <laughs> because I got saved. Now I'm talking about Jesus all the time, and my grandma came all the way from Israel to tell me I was crazy. <laughs> she paid a whole ticket and said, you're crazy. You are dishonoring the family. She was just really nasty with me. Because they, they thought I left Christianity. Because anybody who is Greek Orthodox, they are so bound in their mind that if you are not a Greek Orthodox, you're going to hell. Quite simple. When I left the Greek Orthodox Church, they were all after me. You can't believe what happened. But Jesus is wonderful. He saved my mom. He saved my dad. He saved the whole family. Thank you, Jesus. Well, Lily, are you ready to sing, my dear? Covered by the blood. Hallelujah. Oh, I, I've got the mic for you. I've got the mic for you. So when, when you people, how many have been to Israel? How many have never been to Israel? You want to go? Okay. Lift your hands. I believe God's going to answer my prayer. Lord, help them go to Israel and give them the money. And Lord, give them enough money to go shopping. Say amen. Okay, he'll answer that prayer. I'll be there in two weeks. I wish you guys can go with me. Yeah, I'm going to be in Israel with Pastor Chris. We're going to do some programs. And uh, while in Israel in two weeks, I'm going to have... Uh, some precious time in Akko. Akko is the, the center of the Crusaders. When the Crusaders uh, took the Holy Land, that was their center. So we're going to do a lot of things in just a few days. You've got to go to Israel, people. Make yourself a promise. You will go to Israel. Say amen. amen. You've been, right? Eight times. Eight times. Wow. I love it. Okay, now you're going to sing for me, Covered by the Blood. Yes. Let's give Lily Knowles a big... God bless you. Thank you. Psalms 32, 1 says, Blessed is the man whose sins are covered. Covered, covered, covered by his father, walking by faith, living in his love. I'm covered, you're covered, covered by his father. Jesus has blessed you. Living in his love, I am covered, 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 covered by 
Come on, take, take your seat. You still got it at 81, Lily? <laughs> Can you sing amen or you want to go sit down and take a breath? I can have a break, please. Okay, have a break, have a break. <laughs> Don't you wish you could have this strength when you're 81? <laughs> Unbelievable. What do you eat for breakfast? What do you eat for breakfast to give you the strength? What do you eat for lunch? What do you eat for dinner? What do you eat, period? Honestly, I'd like to know. Well, I have a smoothie in the morning, uh, high protein something. And, and? And then I don't have any lunch. I just have something about two broiled chicken or fish. I don't eat uh, pork, and I only eat beef once a week, and vegetables. No potatoes, no rice. Organic? Uh, oh, of course. Yes. And I go work out every other day. You what? You do or you don't? I do. <laughs> That's where you get that. You work out in a gym? Really? You run? Yes. You walk? Yes, and do everything. <laughs> Pastor Benny, my, my mom was 94 when she passed away, and my grandma was 102. So I say if I take care of myself and Jesus doesn't return, then maybe I can live a long time. I think you will. Yes. Yeah, somebody said, wow, you're right. Amazing. Saints, just before I minister the word, I want to go ahead and take the offering early tonight because I don't want to do it at the I do not want to do it at the end. 
And I just want to remind all of you of the promises of God for just the next few minutes. So don't prepare your offering yet. Don't prepare it yet. Just give me a few moments to talk to you about what the Bible has to say about the blessings of the Lord financially. God cares about your finance. Because Jesus cares about you. 90% Derek Prince used to say that 90, and I think he was right, that 90% of our time is spent in connection in one way or another to finance. Clothing, food, shelter, all that. And, and when you look at the Word of God, can I be blunt with you tonight? Yes. Yeah. I think the prosperity message has gone too far. Because some have focused on money rather than on the promises. And I think we've all been caught in that trap. Because true prosperity is no lack. None lacked among them. And that's all the New Testament. So when people begin to focus on a big house, uh, lots of this and lots of that, I, th I think they lose the real message of the Bible. The real message of the Bible is quite simple. He'll take care of you. Jesus said, don't worry about tomorrow. He'll take care of you. And, and when you read the Bible, look, I've been reading the Bible. I think I'm reading it now more than I've ever read it in my life. And I'm studying it in Hebrew. In fact, I have two professors now teaching me the language, not one. Oh, I'm having fun with that. I have Sigal Zohar from the Institute, which is a part of Hebrew University. And now I have Danny Bengigi. You people got to meet Danny Bengigi. Former director of Hebrew studies at Arizona State. One of the most brilliant minds I've ever met in my life on Hebrew. And he's going to be here with us soon. In fact, I think he's watching tonight. He lives in Phoenix, Arizona. And he's from Israel. He's a Messianic, Holy Ghost, Israeli. He's in his 70s, and he is brilliant. He showed me things in the Bible I never saw before. I think this will really, really bless you. He said, you know how it says in the Bible in the blessing that God gave Moses, the Lord will bless you, the Lord will keep you, make his face shine upon you, give you peace. It's, it, now, he, he showed me this. He said, now, look what it says. The Lord will lift up his countenance upon you. The Lord will lift up his countenance. He said, why would God look up at you? He said, doesn't it kind of cause a question in your mind? The Lord will lift up his countenance as though you're higher than him. I said, explain that to me. He said that Hebrew, lift up, means to lift you up and look at you like you are holding up your baby. I, we, we, we were so moved that he began crying. He said, when it says the Lord will lift up, it's like he's lifting you up and looking up at you. Like you're, when you lift up your own child. What a God we serve. Can you throw him a kiss for that? Come on, people. Mwah. Come on. That he loves you so much to treat you like this. And so it says the Lord will lift up his countenance, holding you up in his arms. So now that I'm reading the word for the first time in Hebrew, and there's so much in Hebrew that is not possible to discover in English because the language, the English language is so limited. So limited. And, and you see, I mean, he was showing me in my class about a few days ago, oh, I got so blessed, almost came out of my skin. It's really hard sometimes to sit still being taught the Hebrew Bible. And he said, I'm going to show you the Trinity in all over Genesis. And I saw the Trinity so much, I didn't, I didn't even think there were so many revelations of the Trinity in the Old Covenant. It was quite powerful. Well, how many would love to learn Hebrew one day? I'll tell you more later. But when you see the scriptures in, 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 in its real meaning, in its real raw meaning, you see such a loving Lord and a covenant God who will take care of his people. And all he looks for is our, our obedience, and we all know that. But I don't see anywhere in the word, as I've been studying it lately, of the extreme message that you hear today. There's balance in the Bible. 
And the balance is quite simple. None lacked in the Old Testament. Nobody lacked. Think about Israel coming out of Egypt. No, not one person had a lack in the desert. Nobody had to go buy clothing for 40 years. Nobody had to go to a dentist for 40 years. Nobody had to go to a doctor 40 years. God kept their shoes new, clothing new. And what's amazing is the clothes grew up with them. That's a miracle. That little kid comes out with a little pair of shoes, and he comes 40 years later, they're still there, and grew up on his own feet. I went to the Sinai. I will never forget the, 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 the uh, power, uh, the, 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 the impact it had on my life. I climbed Mount Sinai twice. I don't know if anyone here has, but I have. It's 9,000 feet up. You see these little Greek women walking up. <laughs> I think it's that, it's, 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 it must be the olive oil, I don't know. <laughs> they were passing us. We were all on camels going up. I, di I didn't want to walk all the way up 9,000 feet. And we're talking about five feet, that's all you have. If you fell, you're gone. That, and that camel, my dear God in heaven, I'll never forget this. He, when, when they come, it was like, think about going this way for 9,000 feet, and you only have five feet. That's all you got. So we're walking by the wall like this, you know. And you look at way down. So we were on these camels till a certain point, and we had to walk. And these Greek little short women were passing the camels. There was, I don't know how many of us went up there. And the camel would come right to the edge. And just before I thought I'm going to die, he'd turn. <laughs> and I was really scared. So I said to the guy, to the Bedouin, I said, listen, don't, don't let him come so close to the edge. He ignored me the whole time. I tried to say it in, my, in the best Arabic I could produce. And he just wouldn't listen. I had with me a man named Peter Bahu. Peter Bahu today is in charge of all the art and the music inside the Vatican. And he and I grew up in the same class. I said, Peter, would you tell that man to stop going so close to the edge and turn around? Couldn't he turn around a little, you know, a little somewhere safer? So he tells him in, in a very, uh, the Arabic language has the classical and has the modern. And I was speaking modern and the guy had no clue what I was saying. So Peter speaks to him in the raw classical Arabic. <laughs> and he says, you tell him the camel knows what he's doing. <laughs> so I kind of was, <laughs> didn't know what to say to the guy. But <laughs> I bought brand new boots right before I climbed the mountain. Brand new. They were destroyed when we came down. Those boots, I had to throw them in the garbage because they were ruined. And I thought, how amazing that my boots that were made out of real good whatever and, and here they are destroyed one day and the children of Israel walking in that desert that we were in ourselves you you can't see even a piece of grass anywhere you thought we thought we we're on the surface of the moon or some planet you couldn't see a green thing nothing nowhere as far as the eye could see it was just desert Nothing but desert. And you think, how could they survive? And what hits you is, how about the animals they had? How did they survive? Nobody ever thinks about the animals. We think about the three million Jewish people coming out of Egypt. But how about the animals that they all had? Surviving. What a God we serve. Amen. For God to take care of them in the desert... And you worry about God taking care of you in California? <laughs> in the United States of America, you know? That was a desert. None lacked among them. What a mighty God. And when you see the prophets, whether it was Elijah, who didn't have a suit, he wore 
skin, animal skin and a belt made out of some skin. God taking care of him and sending a raven to feed him. Then sending him to Shunem, up northern Israel, by Haifa. And a woman taking care of him. No lack. Not one day did he lack breakfast. Not one day did he lack lunch or dinner. Imagine God taking care of that amazing prophet to walk all the way to Horeb. Now you sweet people, if you look on your map, you'll see that Horeb is right on the tip, southern tip of Sinai. To fly today from where Elijah was in Haifa, all the way down is a good hour and a half flight. He walked all the way down to Beersheba with his helper, left him behind, then walked all the way by himself. Did God take care of him? You bet. The angel cooked his lunch. <laughs> Enough nutrition in that lunch to last a long time. And we all worry about tomorrow's meal. No lack. But when you look at the master himself, our dear Jesus, what do you see in his life? He didn't have a home to live in. He did not even have a bicycle to ride. He had no lack. And God spoke to women who took care of him. It says so in Luke. And you think about Paul the Apostle. No lack. To say in whatsoever state I am, I'm content. Yet the Bible does not deny in the scripture we are commanded to give. In the Old Covenant, God made that very clear to the Israelites. They were to bring an offering to him three times a year, in fact. They were to give sacrifices, animals, daily to be offered on, on, on the altar of sacrifice in the tabernacle and so forth. So we see giving throughout the word of God. We, we cannot deny that God commands and commanded and still commands us to give to his work. That's in the Bible. You cannot take it out. And, and how they gave is quite remarkable. So when Moses came in Exodus and said, I, and because God had said to him in Exodus 25, now go collect an offering. He said, I want gold and silver and I want certain materials, certain colors. I want certain jewels and such like for the tabernacle. It says they brought so much of it that Moses had to say no more. We have more than enough. So there was a spirit of giving in the camp. An amazing, generous, generous spirit of giving to build the tabernacle. If you look how much gold was in there, it would amaze you. Amaze you. So much gold in the tabernacle. Now, the talents of the day were way more than today's, the way they count gold today. But you just think about a golden uh, Ark of the Covenant covered with gold, with wood underneath. You, you think about the altar of incense covered with gold completely. You think about the lampstand, all gold, no wood at all in it. You, th you, th you think about the table of showbread covered with gold and all its instruments. There was gold in the holy place, gold in the holy of, of holies, anywhere you looked. If you went out to the, to the first part of the, of the tabernacle, the yard, you saw brass everywhere. But, but think about what they gave. All that gold they brought out of Egypt. Why did God give it to them? For his service. Why will God bless us? For one reason. To obey him. They had so much gold and no one went shopping. Think about all the gold they brought. Enough earrings to build a calf. Enough earrings on the Israelites to build that big calf that Moses had to destroy. So think about the wealth in their hands when they came out of Egypt. So God wants to bless his people, for, most certainly. But why does God bless us? Why? So we can build his work. At that time, to build his tabernacle. Think about all the blessings that 
David gave and Solomon gave for the temple. Stunning information. I just finished reading it. Cedar wood covered with gold everywhere in the Holy of Holies and the Holy Place. So God never promised us we would have lack. None will lack. And it depends on our need. Some are greedy. No, no, it's not about greed. It's about need. He promised to meet your needs, not your greed. But he asks one thing, obedience. Just plain obedience. And so Jesus gives it to us in one beautiful uh, headline. Give, it shall be given unto you. Simple. And he adds good measure. So when, when God blesses us, he will bless us with such abundance, we'll never lack. He said, good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over shall man give to your bosom. God wants to bless you so much that you'll have enough for your children, grandchildren, to be a blessing to others. So God says to Abraham, I will bless you and I'll make you a blessing. But when people focus on the material things, that's when, things go, that's when it all goes wrong. That's when they focus on the things, uh, the things, the money, the this, the that. No, no. Our source is the Lord. We focus on Jesus. He'll bless us. And Paul the Apostle spent, wrote two chapters in Corinthians all about giving for one reason, to help the saints in Jerusalem who had gone through famine. So today, when you give with a heart for the gospel, and I think this is what the problem is. We have taken the gospel out of our giving. Now we give so we can get. That's the problem. Did you hear that? People give to get, and that's when God says, okay, I'm, I'm not going to bless them. No, we give because we love him. We give because we want to see the gospel preached to the world. A lady uh, in, in one conference began to argue with me about this. And I said, lady, I want to show you something. I said, let's, and by the way, let's, let's all go to it, okay? Let's go to 2 Corinthians. I want to show you something. Paul the apostle, because somehow her pastor convinced her that you give to get. I said, well, I said, let's look at the Bible together. And she was not too happy about what I showed her. So I said, okay, let's look at 2 Corinthians 9. That's the chapter that we, in fact, 8 and 9 are the two chapters Paul wrote about giving to the church. But I said, now, all right, we, we all believe, because he was talking about ministering to the saints. If you look at verse 1, he said, for as touching the ministering to the saints, what, which saints in Jerusalem who were going through some financial struggles. So they had gone to Macedonia. They had gone to, at that time, Greece, called Achaia, and raised money from the different churches for the need in Jerusalem, for the saints in need. So he said, now, when it comes to ministering to the saints, it's not necessary for me to write. But he said, I know the forwardness or the readiness of your mind for which I boast of you when I was in Macedonia and so forth. And then he kind of begins to build their faith about giving to the saints. And then he says in verse 6, but this I say, he which soweth sparingly will reap also sparingly, and he which soweth bountifully will reap also bountifully. And this is where they focus on. You give little, you get little. You give much, you receive much. Well, all right, that's in the Bible. But let's keep it in the same heart with the chapter. So he says, every man according as he has purposed in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity. God loves a cheerful giver. Now think what, what happens often is people get under pressure. They, they get challenged too much to give. And, and when they, they do, they, they give out of emotion, they give out of fear. Okay, now I know people may be shocked right now to listen to what I have to say, but I think it's time for you to know the way I really feel about it. People look at me and so say, he teaches prosperity. If they really knew what I believe, they'd be shocked in a good way. Because really, as I'm getting older, I, I'm believing less and less about that message, the way it's being preached anyways. Yeah, hallelujah is right, lady. 
And uh, I've been asked, well, are you ready to tell the world how you feel? I said, not yet. I'm going to tell them one day. Because I don't want to hurt my friends who believe something different. But I, I, I will say this, and this is what, where they miss it, where they seem to just never point to the one thing that I think is so important. But anyways, so it says, as God is able to make all grace abound, verse 8, toward you, you're going to have all sufficiency and so forth. And verse 9, he that has dispersed abroad and so on, given to the poor, his righteousness will endure. God gives seed to the sword and all that. And okay, finally, this is in the Bible. But that's where they stop. But if you go to verse 13, something hits you that is the heart of giving right there. He said, whilst by the experiment of this ministration, they glorify God for your professed subjection unto the gospel of Christ. That's the key. Why are you giving? Because you want to see the gospel go around the world. You are, you, you've made your life subject to the gospel. It's not about I give to get. It's I give because I love the gospel. Did you hear that? Yes. This is where they miss it. So the Bible does say, you know, if you give sparingly, you receive and, and so forth. I agree. I agree with all that. But how about the gospel? The real heart of the message of prosperity that has messed up a whole lot of people out there that got very upset with the message because they leave the gospel out. Because then it becomes greed. You, you give a thousand, you'll get this, and you give this, you get that. Uh, 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 wait, hold it. Why are you giving? Are you giving to get this? Are you giving to get that? No. God will give you way more than you can ever believe for if you give to the gospel. Did you hear that? He'll give you way more than you can confess and believe and do, do this and do that and scream and shout and sweat and holler. He'll give you way more if you focus on the gospel. How we need to get the gospel today out of the world. Okay, I'm changing. I'm glad. And I'll change probably more as I get older. Because I've traveled enough to see that the message of the gospel is the same everywhere. It works everywhere. But when people start to focus on greed, something is wrong. It's just that simple. So how many of you love Jesus? How many love his gospel? Well, then you will give. And, and we give according to what we have, not what we don't have. And so the Bible says, it says, God, through Paul, said, you give what you have, not what you don't have. So today... I'm going to ask you to do something because our minister has made a wonderful decision to increase our, our reach on social media for the young people today. Uh, in, June, in June, we are going to do something. We're going to begin to do something. I was about to announce the date, but I still need to have some confirmations. But I'm going to have... God willing, soon, we're, we're going to have a regular youth meeting with the singers, many of them that have become my friends, uh, that were at the Send. Many of the very famous names are going to come here, and they're going to minister the gospel to the kids. I'm not going to be the only one ministering. I'll minister here and there. I'll probably just show up and just enjoy. But I want to see the young people of America shaken for God. Let me hear a big amen. amen. So we are doing something new. Now many of you are going to give to the number on your screen. Some of you are, are watching Lovewood. You're going to give to Lovewood for what they're doing around the world. Those that are watching BHM social media for Benny Hill Ministries, I'm going to ask you to give to help with this new uh, thrust, this new vision God has put in my heart. Because I believe it's time we reach the young people of America. Now, I'm going to tell you something. You know, I'm so proud of David. I'm so proud of Chris and Brandon and James that all have amazing ministries. Now, you're about to become a pastor of a big church in Palm Springs. I'm proud of you. Hallelujah. 
Yeah, this young man. These, these kids are shaking the world right here. I mean, David, your ministry is, has an amazing impact. Oh, by the way, he just had a baby. I think, it, why don't you stand up with me a second. Tell them about the miracle God gave you. Come on. Oh, yeah. Um, well, my wife, hold, hold my wife, Jess, and I weren't able to have children because both sides of her tubes were blocked. And so we had, tried, we had been told by the doctors that basically we would have to go for IVF. So we began to believe for our miracle, and Pastor Benny actually prayed for us. When we asked you if you could pray, you said, this is my specialty. This is kind of what you're known for, I think. And so, so oh, yeah, almost. <laughs> so we had you pray. In fact, we, we actually looked at, into it afterwards, and we found that it was the day after you prayed that the baby was conceived. And so our little Aria now is one week old today. And so we have our miracle. I'm so proud of you. But I mean, you know, you see these amazing ministries God is raising. Chris, look at you. You look incredible. When you came the last time, you were not feeling well. So you're good now. Yes, sir. Much better. Yeah. Thank you, Jesus. Yay. They travel and minister. And this young man who helps me, takes care of me, he's about to get married in July. July 7th is his wedding. And uh, what, a, what, what a blessing to our life he's been, you know. He was a pastor at the vineyard churches, weren't you? In? In uh, Champaign, Illinois. It was one of the largest vineyards. No. And you left the, ch the ministry, your, your, your ministry. When you found me, I knew the Lord. I knew the opportunity I had for you was greater. And I knew if I wanted to go to another place, I had to lay down what I was already doing. And I was already traveling, seeing signs and wonders, seeing God use me. But I knew I had to come serve the man of God to go where I really How do you like being with me? Oh, there's nothing like it, Pastor. <laughs> we pray and we cry and we worship and we, oh, hallelujah. So I mean, yesterday I was teaching on the, on, the, on the blood and he's holding my phone. And he's just praying in tongues the whole time I'm praying. The whole time I'm ministering, he, you, you were just flying high yesterday. Amen, Pastor. Sure love you. You're going to have a great future. Remember that. And you know what? He, he'll never stop traveling with me, by the way. You're going to be with me for life, except you're going to be living in Atlanta. Yes, sir. Well, okay. <laughs> I understand those things. Well, there's Brandon. He lives here. He'll help a little bit. And who knows? You know, God, God knows. But the thing that I want you to know is the Bible is quite clear. The promise is quite clear. God wants to bless your life when you focus on his people. And today, worldwide, here and around the world, and many of you watching Lovell and other uh, platforms, there's, there's needs everywhere. But today in this country called America, we need revival. Yes. Yesterday, I had with me the, some of the people from that movie Unplanned. They were here yesterday. And they told me two million people have seen the movie now. The theaters have been packed, and I think it's fabulous. But they've had a lot of opposition, even from churches. You heard me right. Even from churches who did not want to promote the movie because they felt it was too political. It's not political. It's about lives. 3,000 abortions a day in this country. Every, and no, no one talks about it. This nation needs a new move of God. Amen. Let me hear an amen. amen. And I think God is going to do it through the young people. Amen. Some of you, and I'm going to close with this, some of you don't, don't, do not remember the real move of God that happened in this country. Would you believe if I tell you, some of you are old enough to remember Merv Griffin and Mike Douglas and, and uh, Johnny Carson and and Phil Donahue, who all had preachers preach on their shows. D did you know that? Somebody said, wow. Who did not know that? Put your hands up. They, they were the, op uh, the Oprah Winfrey of the day. They were the voice, whatever you call that, the whatever. All these shows that are so popular now in the daytime. What was really the four names that were very popular in, in America that had their own programs on the big networks like ABC, NBC, CBS. Mike Douglas, Merv Griffin, 
Johnny Carson, and I named one more, I just forgot him. Phil Donahue. Phil Donahue had Miss Kuman on. Johnny Carson had Catherine Kuman on. She, she had a standing ovation. Mike Douglas, who was the Oprah Winfrey of the day, had Oral Roberts preach the gospel on his show. He preached the fourth man on the program. Healing evangelists would show up on those shows and pray for the sick. Give words of knowledge out and lay hands, people falling on the floor. On secular television. Do it again, Lord. These were the days when PTL had more people go than Disney World. A Christian ministry in North Carolina had more people a day than Disney World had. And they were all Christians. Millions a day would go to, to PTL to hear the gospel and preachers. I was one of the preachers. I was young who would go preach at PTL and you too. PTL began with Paul Crouch and Jim Baker. And then TBN was born out of that. And they all used to work for Pat Robertson. People don't know that CNN began from a Christian TV station in Atlanta. How many of you knew that? Just a few of you. How many did not know that? Look at all of you. All of you. WTBS Atlanta was a Christian TV station owned by Pat Robertson, who sold it to Ted Turner, who turned it into CNN. So CNN at one time was a Christian station. That's how mighty God was moving in this country. But today nobody knows that. The new generation doesn't even know these things happened. This is a great nation still today. God will visit it one more time. No, I want to hear a big amen. We need a new move of the Spirit. And I'm convinced it will be the young people. Because I saw what happened at the sand when I stood and cried. And saw Jeremy and Stephanie and Lindy and those amazing kids leading worship. And 59,000 kids standing in front of us. And you standing on the front row calling on God. You were crying so hard, nobody missed you on the front row. <laughs> what are you looking for? Come on, I want to hear you. Just getting closer to God. Uh, that's your mama right there. Yeah. We need more people in this country who are like this young man that are looking for Jesus. And there's out there by the thousands and the hundreds of thousands. It's time we'll reach them. Help me do it, will you? Yes. Lift your hands, pray in the Holy Ghost. Come on. Yeah. You that are watching Love World, you can give to Love World to reach the world and the U.S. Those that are watching our, our, our platforms, Benny Hill Ministries, and here, you're going to give to our ministry to help me do what God called me to do that is burning deep in my soul now for those young people. To see the gospel reach them. Oh, how we need it. To see the power of God go through social media. Yesterday, look at me, all of you a second. Yesterday, and I'm, I, I just began to do a weekly program now where I teach. I'm teaching on the blood. I began yesterday teaching on the, on the blood. And as of this morning, over 100,000 people saw that thing. Just yesterday, I sat and just talked about the blood. And over 100,000 so far have seen it on social media. What we do tonight will be seen by over 200,000 people. So social media is the future. Very few are watching TV like they used to. Most are watching it on the phones now. Let's reach them. Father, I pray in Jesus' name you'll bless your people as they give. Anoint your people. Bless their tomorrow. Bless their families. And Lord, there'll be no lack in their life in Jesus' name. Lift your hands and thank him. No lack in your life or future. That God will bring the love of the gospel back in your heart. It will take hold of your life, is my prayer for you in Jesus' name. That you'll give because you love Jesus. That you'll give and you love his gospel. And to see the nations hear the gospel with power. And God's people said, Amen. Amen. All right, let's pass the offering envelopes.
I'm going to ask you to give to the Lord from your heart. Bless his work from your heart. And I want everyone to give here tonight. Give your best. God has given us his best. Hallelujah. It's beginning to rain. Rain, rain. Hear the voice of the Father. Saying who shall ever will. Come drink of the water. Come on, help me, Lily. He said, I promise to pour my spirit out on your sons and your daughters. If you're thirsty and dry, lift your hands to the sky. It's, it's beginning, beginning to, to rain. rain. I want to hear her mic, please, the orange one. It's beginning it's to rain, rain, rain. 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 Hear the voice of the Father Saying who so ever will Come drink of the water I promise to pour my spirit out On your sons and your daughters If you're thirsty and dry Lift your hands to the sky It's beginning to rain Come on, Lily, help me sing it again. It's beginning to rain, rain, rain. Hear the voice of the Father saying, Whosoever will come drink of the water, I promise to pour my spirit out on the sons and your daughters. If you're thirsty and dry, lift your hands to the sky. It's beginning to rain. If you're thirsty and dry, lift your hands to the sky. It's beginning to rain. There's a river. I'm glad you're here to help me like this. We'll, uh, we'll, let's just do it a key that she's com comfortable with. There is a river. That flows from deep within. Let me hear her mic, please. There is a fountain that frees the soul from sin. Come to the water. There is a vast supply. There That never shall run dry. Can you go up a key? There is a river that flows from deep within. Go ahead, guys. There is a fountain that frees the soul from sin. Come to the waters, there is a vast supply, there is a river that never shall run dry. Now your favorite, fill my cup, Lord, all by yourself. Um. Shall I help you? No. I think she's looking for her My key. key. All right, it's all yours. Mm. Like the woman at the well, I was seeking for things that could not satisfy. <laughs> and then I heard my Savior speaking draw from my well that never shall run dry fill my cup Lord I lift it up Lord come and quench this thirsting of my soul Oh, bread of heaven, feed me 
till I want no more. Here's my cup, fill it up and make me whole. There are millions in this world, Lily. There are millions in this world who are seeking the things that earthly things afford. But none can match this wondrous treasure that I found in Jesus Christ, my Lord. Can you sing that second verse again? There are millions in this world. There are millions in this world. Who are craving. Who are craving. The things, this world, the things. The things this world can afford. Cannot afford. But none can match the wondrous treasure. But none can match this wondrous treasure that, I find. that we find in Jesus Christ our Lord. Would you lift your hands, sing with her? Come on, fill, fill my cup, Lord. Fill my cup, Lord. I lift it up, Lord. I lift it up, Lord. Come and quench. Come and quench. This thirsting in my soul. This thirsting of my soul. Bread of heaven. Oh, bread of heaven. Feed me till I want no more. Here's my cup. Fill it up. And make me whole. Now before you sing, amen. I'm going to be gone all of May. And uh, I want to have another service before I leave. Because uh, the first part of May, I'm in Israel. I go from Israel to Germany, from Germany to Hungary, from Hungary to the Ukraine, from the Ukraine back here. On the 27th, I'm, 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 I'm going to be with the largest church in Europe, in Budapest. Looking forward for that. And uh, they're, I, I think they have 70,000. Zillard, is not about right? 70,000 in your church? That's his church. You've got 100,000 people in that church. And they, they meet in a stadium, right? Yeah. What an amazing month we're going to have. And then I come back and I said, I don't want to travel in June. I want to be around. Because I'm getting too old. Well, not really. No, I'm not. You're 81. What, what am I talking about? <laughs> I'm 67. You're 81. Look at you. I just need to have the right diet and go work out like you have. But I want to have a service here on the 29th, April 29th. And probably by then I will announce the date for the youth uh, event. So can you come back the 29th? I'll make you a deal. I will tell you later. No, no, I just don't know my schedule unless oh, I look Lord, at it. Yes. But I will call Pam tomorrow. Please. Yes. How many want to be, be back the 29th? Mm. A great healing meeting here and much more. But sing for me right now before I preach the word. Amen. Mm -hmm. Well, 2 Corinthians 1.20 says, All the promises of God are yes and amen. So it doesn't matter what I say. All you have to say is amen. So uh, you can clap your hands and sing along and just get it. <laughs> amen. I'll bring you in. Amen. 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 Everybody say. Let me hear you say. It's a story about Jesus Christ. 
our Savior. Amen. See the little baby. He was laid in a manger on a Bethlehem morning. Amen. Amen. See him at the seashore. He was talking with the fishermen and making them disciples. Amen. Amen. Riding in Jerusalem. drops of blood praying to his father not my will but thine be done the soldiers came they bound our Jesus and took him away folks he was led before Pilate he was beaten and they crucified him oh, but on the third day he rose amazing thank you give the Lord a mighty hand of praise now I'll, I would like you all to stand for just a few moments everyone standing for just a few moments and I want you all to pray in the spirit for just three minutes come on everyone standing if you can The greatest things in all my life is loving you. The greatest thing in all my life is loving you. I want to love you, Lord. I want to love you, sweetest Lord. The greatest thing in all my life is loving, loving you. Keep praying, saints, just a few more minutes. The greatest thing in all my life is serving you. Yes, Lord. The greatest thing in all my life is serving you. I want to serve you, serve you, Lord. I want to serve you, sweetest Lord. The greatest thing in all my life is serving, serving you. Keep praying, saints. Bless the Lord, oh, my soul. Bless the Lord. My soul and all that is within me, bless His holy name. Sing with me now, bless the Lord. Oh, my soul, lift your voice and say, Bless the Lord. Oh, my 
soul and all that is within me bless bless the Lord oh my soul bless the Lord This power would you or evil a victory win? There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power. ask you a question. Would you be free from every burden and every sin? What's your answer? There's power in the There's power in the Would you or evil a victory win? What's your answer? There's wonderful power with hands uplifted. There is power, there is power, wonder working power in the blood of the land. There is power, wonder working power seats. I want to minister tonight before we take communion on the blood covenant. Because tonight we celebrate the victory of Calvary. We celebrate the triumph of the cross. And I want everyone here and everyone throughout the world to begin to understand this amazing power that you find through the scriptures. Because as you study the scriptures, you, you come to the conclusion that 
the saints of the Old and New Testament knew something that we need to find out. There was a, a power, there was an influence in their life that uh, moved them, that they understood even their prayers, even their worship was in response to that knowledge we all need so bad. What is that something they had? What is that knowledge they had? What is that something in their life they understood that we just don't get? I can tell you this. The moment we grasp, and may the Lord give us that knowledge, and I believe when God gives it to us, Something marvelous is going to happen in the body of Christ. None will have cancer on that day. None will be diseased on that day. I spoke to T.L. Osborne one day. I said, T.L., you've seen miracles in your ministry. T.L. Osborne was probably one of the greatest healing evangelists of our day. There was Catherine Kuhlman. There was Oral Roberts and T.L. Osborne. Catherine shook America. Oral for years shook the nation and established ORU. Oral had his tent meetings for eight years only and then established Oral Roberts University. But T.L. Osborne had more miracles worldwide than any man alive. I saw a picture when I went to preach for his sister in Texas when I was in my 20s. She said, I want to show you something. There was a picture of this man on the platform with T.L. Osborne talking to him that had no leg. And you see the leg missing in the photo. She said, now look at this picture. Ten minutes later, he had a leg. I saw both pictures, the same platform, the same clothing, the same crowd behind. You see one picture, no leg, holding crutches, the whole leg gone, missing. And a second picture, the crutches on the platform, and the man standing with two legs. And so I said to T.L. Osborne one day, when he came to be with me on this is your day, and he'd been with me many, many times. I said, what's the key? What is the key? Why is it you have such miracles in Africa that we need in America? He said, because in Africa they understand one thing that we don't in America. I said, what is it? The covenant. The covenant. He said, if we would grasp the truth of the covenant, none will be sick in the church. Hallelujah. We still have not. We still have not. So that something, that power, that amazing influence in their prayer, in their worship, in their knowledge, their response to the word, what was it? What was it they understood that we must understand? The covenant. The power in a covenant. So I said to Tiel, I said, Tiel, Jesus healed many who did not understand the covenant. Ah, he said, that's something you must understand. He said, the unbeliever, he healed because of his mercy. The believer, he healed because of his covenant. He said, that's why when people lose their healing, they don't understand the covenant. Anyone who understands the covenant cannot lose that miracle. Because when I was in India, 
I saw many who were not Christians healed. I'll never forget the little girl who came up with polio. Crying on the platform, she said, why? Why would he heal me? Why would he heal me? With three million people standing in the crowds. I said, because of his mercy. And I remembered T.L. Osborne telling me that before she ever asked me that question. It says, mercy, I said. It says, mercy. I said, a Hindu little girl was crying. May the Holy Spirit, I pray today, give us such truth, such insight. Before we have communion, Heavenly Father, before we partake, such insight about the covenant we have with you. Oh, people, lift your hands and ask him to give you that understanding tonight. That clear understanding, we've got to, we've got to, we've got to understand it. They understood the gospel to be the working out of that covenant. Many of us don't understand that. The concept of a covenant is almost unknown to us. Yet this concept of covenants is known, documented in ancient societies among people of the third world to this day. So the people who lived in Bible days lived in an atmosphere of covenants. The very air they breathed dealt with covenants. All relationships. Linked to covenants. The family unit. Covenant. Look at this. Today we don't see that. That's why divorce is happening in the church. They don't understand it's a covenant. A covenant. The very Bible we have, the very the very word of God we love is called the book of the covenant. Exodus 24, 7, the book of the covenant. Deuteronomy 7, 9, the God who keeps covenant. The Hebrew word means to bind. Binding an obligation. A covenant is binding, unbreakable. It's an obligation between two parties. That brings forth a loving relationship. Covenant. And the only way you can break a covenant is with death. So we have to understand. In making covenant with us, God used human covenants to help us understand, to help us get it. Put those buckets down, brother. By having an understanding of the ingredients that made human covenants, we can better understand that covenant that God made with us in His Son. Oh, give us that understanding. Please give us an understanding. So when a group or a people will enter into covenants, they would select a, a representative A substitute called the guarantor of the covenant. And that individual, his actions, his achievements, became the actions, the achievements of the group or the nation. A, an example would be Goliath, who represented the actions of the Philistines. David, the actions of Israel. So in many ways, David becomes Israel and Goliath becomes the Philistines. He is the representative of the nation. The guarantor becomes the actual nation. 
the representative becomes the whole country. So when Jesus came on earth, he became the covenant. He's called in Isaiah 49, the covenant. And he is the covenant represent heaven. And all that heaven represents in him. All that God represents was in him. God's guarantor, God's representative to humanity. We see something powerful in the Bible. That a covenant is not a contract. Because contracts are negotiables. You can negotiate contracts. You can break contracts. You can cancel contracts. A covenant cannot. Because it's the giving of the whole person. Nothing to do with uh, an agreement that you can negotiate to change. A covenant is made with an oath. Binding the individual to fulfill the oath. The words spoken would bind that individual into the covenant. So God Almighty, I give you praise, Lord. God Almighty made a covenant with the Jewish people. And they broke it. They broke it while God was giving it to Moses. So he declared in Genesis 22 and in Hebrews, By myself have I sworn, saith the Lord. For that to happen, then God had to do it alone. He could not find a representative on earth, so he became a man. And Jesus became the representative of humanity. As the Father, the representative of heaven. And the Father and the Son made a covenant on our behalf that can never be broken. And in that covenant is every promise in the scripture. And once you are in Jesus, you are in the covenant. You become a part of the covenant. Now, something very, very powerful. In Genesis 15, the covenant demanded the shedding of blood. An animal was slain, split in two. Parties had to walk through the slain animal. So when God made the covenant with Abraham, the animal was slain and split apart, and God, the fire of God, walked through the animal. Sealed it with Abraham. Every time you see a covenant, you see something very, very powerful. You see dinner. Tonight, we're going to ignite the covenant. Get ready tonight because when you, when you partake of communion, something is going to happen. That will trigger every promise God made to you. Now, I want you to hear me now. In Jesus, there's a mystery. In Jesus, there's a residence. There's a substance. There is something eternal. There's a, a reality that's eternal. I gotta say it one more time because the moment Jesus becomes real in your life, he brings with him, Lord, help me tell them this. He brings with him a substance. Let me ask you something. You have never seen him, have you? 
you were not there 2,000 years ago, were you? But he's more real to you tonight than to the crowds that saw him. What is that called? Substance. Do you, do, do you, do you love him? James, do you love him? How much? You tell me how much. <laughs> I can't say. <laughs> Everything. The crowds that saw him didn't love him like that. They said, crucify him. You love him, Brandon? How much? For my life. What is that something? What is that reality? What is that whatever you want to call it? I call it substance. His substance, his substance came into you and you became one with him. One in spirit. One in flesh, David. You, you, you've got to hear this. When you guys got saved, he got real to you in a second. You didn't have to go read a book to convince yourself that that reality was real. So today you're sitting behind me. You know why I put these giants of the faith behind me? I feel strength. Anyone behind me is weak in the Holy Ghost, you can feel the difference. These are preachers of the gospel. Why? There's substance in them. The Holy Spirit has poured it in them. Where well, Jesus is more real to them than to the crowds that saw him in Galilee. More real to you than to the apostles before the cross. More real to you than any disciple that walked with him in the flesh. Not one of them said to the Lord, walking in the flesh, I want to know you. But Paul cries, I want to know him. What caused, what caused a murderer, a blasphemer, one who forced others to blaspheme, to become the greatest saint that ever lived? The substance of Christ Jesus in his life. Overnight, he went from Saul of Tarsus, who was there for one reason, to put them in prison, to preach them the gospel. What is it? It's that mystery. It's that reality. It's that substance that manifests in communion. Tonight, that substance is going to take hold of you. Lift your hands and ask him to do it. And when that substance takes hold of you, your sickness will die. That he'll become more real to you during communion than to his very disciples in the upper room. When Jesus said to them, this is my body, there was no substance. There was no Calvary. There was no resurrection. When he said to them, this is my blood. Today we have substance. That this Jesus becomes the substance in our lives. More real than anything around us. More real than any person next to us. More real than our family. More real than the breath that we breathe. And that reality, that mystery, is the bridge between humanity and divinity. And that mystery is released and revealed during dinner. Whenever someone makes a covenant, it ignites 
with dinner. Dinner ignites the covenant. So in the scriptures, we see many covenants. We see many meals. And we don't understand why the meal was necessary. Example, in Genesis 26, 28, and 31, we see a, a covenant between a man named Abimelech and Isaac. They had a problem. It had to do with land and cattle and wealth and so forth and so on. And they came and made a covenant with each other. And the Bible tells us when they made the covenant, something had to happen. Something had to take place to ignite the covenant. And so it declares in Genesis 26, I'm going to read for you. Verse 28, they said, we saw certainly that the Lord was with you. And we shall let there now be an oath betwixt us, even betwixt us and thee. Let us make a covenant with thee that you'll do us no harm. We'll do you no harm. They made the covenant. And then it says in verse 30, and he made them a feast and they did eat and drink. Why? Ignites the promises. Brings to life what was promised. I see that in your eyes, kiddo. Give me your hand. Sit down. I see it in your eyes. I see substance in your eyes. What, what am I looking at when I look at this face with tears streaming down his face? I see the substance and the mystery and the reality called Jesus. Shining through him. What is it? And when we worship, and when we pray, and when we read the word, we become a part of it. We become enveloped, embraced in it. The very word falling, falling, falling. The Spirit of God fell and fell upon him. That very word means embrace. It means embrace in the Greek. Like the prodigal son embraced by his father who would not let him go. I have news for you. We have been embraced by the Holy Ghost. And that embrace is called substance. Holy Ghost substance clothed with the Son of God, with His reality. You could be having a bad day, a bad moment, something going wrong with your day, and then shut the door like I did today. And put some beautiful worship and take your Bible and three minutes later, you cry. And you say, Jesus, I love you. All that you did minutes ago is forgotten. It doesn't even exist. You walk into substance. You leave one world and come into another with one whisper of his name. I live a very busy life. I never know what will happen in the morning. Uh, sometimes I get up and I open my email and I get upset. Because somebody sent me an email from staff and I didn't like what they had to say. I get on the phone. Stressed out. Not too happy. Spend three hours with something that didn't exactly have to happen. Then comes that beautiful time in my day where I shut them all out. I shut my phone. Plain mode. Sometimes I shut it all together. I put the phone down volume down on my landline so it doesn't ring and I push the button and I hear the beautiful music and I say Jesus and I'm gone 
I'm in another life, another world where I really belong. But we have to come down the valley every so often to deal with the troubles of life. But when we are in that place, if we would only begin to practice something that we all must make the promise to God today, that we will not do it just on Good Friday or Sunday in church when the communion elements are passed and we don't even know what we're saying when we take communion, that we would have communion in our own bedroom in our own homes just with the Lord. The life you would have, the life you would experience, the change that would happen in your life would be supernatural. Because in that meal, you start to see through a new lens. Every covenant in Scripture had to end with a meal and in that meal, it became valid. In that meal, it became functional. In that meal, it was triggered with power. And it's about to happen tonight. I don't care what you're going through. I want you to prepare your heart for that meeting now. Lift your hands and ask him to prepare your heart for that meeting with God for that moment when you're going to cross over the bridge into a new world have it tonight today whenever you're watching whatever you're watching Jacob comes back from the house of Laban Laban comes after him he could have been killed but now they make a covenant with each other and so the word of God declares something so powerful now come thou, he says. Let us make a covenant, I and thou. And Jacob took a stone, set it up for a pillar. Jacob said to his brethren, gather stones. And it says, and they did eat there. All the troubles he had with Laban all those years came to an end. At dinner. At dinner. Abraham receives the promise of Isaac. Genesis 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 24 years pass by. Think about 24 years. Nothing happens. God makes the promise. It doesn't show up. Till Genesis 18, God shows up. And now there's something new about it. Abraham recognizes the moment. Oh, that was so glorious. When God comes and says to Abraham, And the Lord appeared unto him in the plains of Mamre, as he sat in the tent door in the heat of the day. He lifted up his eyes and looked, and lo, three men stood by him. When he saw them, he ran to meet them from the tent door. He bowed himself and said, Adonai, my Lord, if now I have found favor in thy sight, pass not away, I pray thee, from thy servant. Let a little water be fetched for you. Wash your feet. Rest yourself. I'll, I'll, I'll go and fetch a morsel of bread to comfort your hearts. And they said, do as you said. But there was, there was a reason God came. There was a reason he came. Abraham ran to the herd, fetched a calf, tender and good, gave it unto the young man, hasted to dress it, took butter, milk, and the calf which he had dressed and set it before them. And he stood by them 
under the tree, and they did eat. And the minute they ate, I will certainly return, he said to him. Right after that, I will certainly return unto thee according to the time of life. And Sarah, a wife, shall have a son. It happened exactly a year later. What triggered the promise? Dinner. No dinner in 12, no dinner in 13, no dinner in 14, no dinner in 15, 16, 17. Not one dinner with God till 18. And now after dinner, I will certainly return. A powerful promise. I will certainly return unto thee according to the time of life. Sarah, thy wife, shall have a son. And as soon as God spoke that, it was done. But why did God wait 24 years? Because he wasn't ready for dinner. Tonight, he is ready for dinner. With you. Lift your hands and say, I'm ready for dinner with you, Lord. And so the Bible goes on. The people of Israel, God makes a covenant with them. What brought them out of Egypt? What delivered them from the Egyptians on the bondage? Dinner. 430 years, no dinner. Bondage. Plague strike the land. No dinner. Till God says, now get a lamb. Kill the lamb. And have dinner. And while they're chewing, they came out of Egypt. Tonight, while you chew, you will be healed. Amen. While you chew, you'll be delivered. If you have dinner with him. But how do you do it? I'm getting there. I'm getting there. I'm getting there. He has a covenant with all Israel. He gives them the law. He tells Moses to come up the mountain. Then he says, now go down and apply the blood on the whole nation. And now come back up again. So he comes back up again. Nothing would have happened till something took place. When now he goes up, he takes the elders with him. For it declares in Exodus 24, 9, Then went up Moses, Aaron, Nadab, Abihu, 70 of the elders. They saw the God of Israel. Under his feet was as it were a paved work of a sapphire stone. The whole body of heaven. Upon the nobles. Of the children of Israel, he did not lay his hand, and they saw God and did eat and drink with him. Wow. The next thing we read, build me a tabernacle, I'm coming down. God no longer said to Moses, come up. Now we've had dinner, I'm coming down. Whenever you have dinner, God will visit your house. You no longer have to go find him. He'll find you. It's time you have dinner with God. And continue to have it every week in your house. Not, 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 not just tonight. Not just tonight. So now this dinner in Exodus 24 changes everything. Luke 22, what happened? Jesus says, dinner. For the new covenant to become valid, there had to be a meal. And so we read in this amazing portion of the Word of God. I give you praise, Lord. I give you praise, Lord. Listen to this. He took the bread. Give thanks and break it. Give unto them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Wow. 
Notice the words. This is my body. Would you open this for me, Tim? My body. Not symbolic. This is my body. Broken for you. Now you look at that verse and something will strike you. Something will hit you. My body, which is given for you. For you. Not only to you. For you. This do in remembrance of me. Likewise, he took the cup. Take the top off totally. This is my blood. My blood. He didn't say symbolic. Likewise, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is, oh dear God, is the covenant. Is the covenant. Not only does it represent, is the covenant. Saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood shed for you. Wow. Why don't we get it? Why don't we see it? Why are we so blind? This do in remembrance. Now, now if you don't understand the truth of it, because it sounds strange to your ears, that we're commanded to eat and drink in order to remember. But there's something here we're missing. Because uh, what he asked us to do is more than just remember. In fact, what he said, we are to reenact. We are to bring back to life the moment. The Jewish people tonight are celebrating Passover. They eat matzah. They eat unleavened bread to remember the suffering of Egypt. They eat the bitter herbs. They drink the wine. They eat the lamb to remember their deliverance. And they repeat around the table tonight every detail of that night. They relive the moment. They relive. They bring it back into the present. That's what remember means. It's not a mental function. It's a living moment with the Lord. Hallelujah. And now the Bible says something amazing. That the Lord Jesus had dinner with them prior to the cross and after the cross. Why? Before the cross ignites the covenant with the church. There would have been no covenant without it. After the cross, the first thing he comes and asks for, dinner. Two dinners. One ignites salvation, one ignites Pentecost. Every dinner in the Bible ignited promises. Brought validity to the covenant. So now the bread and the wine become a door. 
the door to a new world, a point of contact with the world of the Holy Spirit. The meal becomes the point where you and I meet God. And tonight, that's exactly what's going to happen. And to understand a little more, remember, it's not a mental activity. It's not a recall of an event. No. It's not a thinking about. No. It's the, it's the activity of your whole being in that moment. That that moment takes hold of your whole being. That you begin to literally be there as though you were 2,000 years ago with him. Recreate the event. Bringing it into the present. Reenacting it. Employing even rituals and symbols to make the reality come true. Come in. The substance becomes alive in those rituals of the Jewish people that they are doing right now while I'm probably talking. So every people, there is a, uh, every year I should say, the people of God of Israel, they, 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 they bring into reality the, 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 the deliverance of Egypt. Now what did Jesus say? He didn't say remember an event. He said remember me. You bring me back into the moment. It's not about what happened. It's who did it. You remember me. You bring me into that union with you. And Paul, the apostle, said something powerful. And I want to I wanna point this out to you. And we, 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 when we read this, sometimes we're not paying attention to what we're really reading. And so now we need the Holy Spirit more than ever in this service to help us understand. So we read. The cup, 1 Corinthians 10, 16. The cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? Wait a minute. The cup? Is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread? The bread which we break? Is it not the communion of the body? Now he explains it. For we being many are one bread and one body. We are all partakers of that one bread. Behold Israel after the flesh. Are not they which eat of the sacrifices partake of the altar? What say I then? Wow. What he's saying is so powerful. That we become a part. Because what he talks about later is quite stunning. What say I then? The idol is anything, or that which is offered in sacrifice to others is anything. But I say that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to devils and not to God. And I would not, watch this, for I would not that ye should have fellowship with them. It's fellowship then. It's fellowship. I come into fellowship with him when I partake the bread. He said, look, when they partake, when they partake of the flesh of an idol, of a sacrifice, they have fellowship with demons. Therefore, we have fellowship with the Son of God. And that fellowship will heal your body. That fellowship will set you free. That fellowship will bring substance you've never known before in your life. And think if you have fellowship every week like that. 
Now here's something powerful. That the word communion or fellowship, it means a unity. So he said, he said, the cup which we bless isn't not the communion, is another fellowship of the blood. The bread we break is another fellowship of the body. So what Paul is saying is eating and drinking. When we eat and drink, we, we, we participate. We become united to the Lord in fellowship and communion. We, we literally take into ourselves. Hear this. Lord, let them see it. We take into ourselves his body. We take into ourselves his blood. And then he said, For we, being many, are one bread, one body. We are all partakers of that one bread. And what he says is, is a mystery. It's a great mystery. That a believer eats of the bread and drinks of the cup. In so doing, he is partaking of Jesus. He becomes one with Jesus. The promise of I in you and you in me is reality. May the Holy Spirit open your understanding. Lift your hands and begin praying in the Holy Ghost. For just a moment, as you pray in the Holy Ghost, something had happened to your spirit, man. Open my eyes, Lord. I want to see Jesus to reach out and touch him to say that I love him open my ears spiritual ears Lord and help me to listen open my eyes sweet Lord I want to see Jesus and Jesus said unto them I am the bread of life he that cometh to me shall never hunger he that believeth on me shall never thirst I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man, and drink his blood you have no life in you wow. whosoever eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life and I will raise him up at the last day for my flesh is meat indeed and my blood is drink indeed he that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood here it is people dwelleth in me and I in him fellowship as the Father, the living Father has sent me, and I live by the Father. So he that eateth me, he shall live by me. It's amazing, Lord. It's amazing. How we've missed it. How we've missed it. It's so real. He that eateth my flesh. You look at me, he that eats my flesh. Tonight we will partake of his flesh. He said to us, this is my body. And they did not understand him. 
They didn't get it. And some of you even now don't get it. The majority get it. This is no longer bread. You're going to take this in your hand in the next few moments. And I want you to look at it and say in your heart, it's his body. And he said to us, He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood dwelleth in me and I in him. As the living Father has sent me, and I live by the Father, so he that eateth me, even he shall live by me. I don't know how clearer he can get. I don't, I, 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 I don't know how more powerful this can get. The bread, the wine, the system by which we're delivered, all the blessings of the covenant become ours. Healing for our entire person are found in this dinner. And so we are called into that covenant meal the food he serves us is his body, his blood. When Jesus said, this is my body given to you, he was giving us himself. Nancy, he was giving you himself. Ellen, when you hold that bread in your hand tonight, you're holding the Son of God not just bread. It's no longer bread. He said, this is my body. Uh, or we believe it, or we question it. And those who question it are going to end up like those in the early church having not discerned the Lord's body. For this reason, many are sick and weak among you, not having discerned the body. To them it was dinner, not the body. I want you to, 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 to listen to me here. I still don't fully understand it. But I think the Catholic Church has a much deeper understanding than we Pentecostals when it comes to dinner. They all line up to come to the priest who holds that bread up. They're not even saved, some of them. And they come and drink of the same cup. When I was a little boy, the whole church drank the same cup. Nobody then thought about germs. We didn't think about the cup. We were scared to death walking up the aisle. And they tell us today that more healings happen in a Catholic communion service than Pentecostal meetings. I wonder why. The Church of Satan marks one communion, the Catholic. I wonder why. I think I know why. They revere this and we don't. We chew it and don't think about the body. Well, tonight it's time you realize it's his body. And John 6 now makes sense. If you eat my body, if you drink my blood, you'll be with me and I'll be with you. And the rest said, who can handle this? They walked away. Not understanding what I'm talking about. In New Mexico, a group of Catholic nuns had me come for communion. I'm kneeling like this on the altar. 
the Reverend Mother was just about as far as this pulpit from me. Sixty Catholic charismatic sisters were around me singing, We give thanks with a grateful heart. We give thanks to the Holy One. And so she's preparing the elements. And I had my eyes closed. And suddenly as they're singing, Jesus Christ, His Son. Dear God, I feel it even now. We give thanks. I felt a robe with my hand. I pulled my hands back. I thought I was touching the robe of the nun. But she was still there preparing the elements. We give thanks. And I close my eyes to the Holy One. I didn't know what happened to me. I thought maybe I'm losing my mind. We give thanks. Because, and all these sisters around me, six at least of them singing, Jesus Christ, it's, and I felt the robe. And I pulled my hands back, opened my eyes. She's still there. And now, let the weak say, I am strong. And I felt knees. I felt the legs of a human being. And I opened my eyes. I could still feel the robe. And she's still over there. I don't understand this. But I can tell you this. He was there. And as he was there, he's here. So lift your hands, sing it with me, we give thanks with a grateful heart. That's the communion. We give thanks because he's given Jesus Christ his son. We give thanks with a grateful heart, we give thanks. Because He's given Jesus Christ, His Son. And now, let the weak say, I am strong. Let the poor say, I am rich because of what the Lord has done for us. And now, let the weak say, I am strong. Let the poor say, Because of what the Lord has done, we give thanks. We give thanks. Keep singing it. We give thanks. We give thanks with a grateful heart. We give thanks to the Holy One. We give thanks because you've given Jesus Christ, your precious Son. We give thanks with a grateful heart. We give thanks, sweet as Holy One. We give thanks. Because you've given Jesus Christ your Son. And now let the weak say, I am strong. Let the poor say, I am rich. Because of what the Lord has done. For us, and now 
Though the weak say I am strong Let the poor say I am I am rich because of what the Lord has done Was wounded for our transgressions and bruised for our iniquities. For I have received of the Lord that which also I have delivered unto you. For the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also, he took the cup. When he had supped, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do ye as often as ye drink it, even tonight in remembrance of me. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show or proclaim the Lord's death till he come. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. But when we are judged, were chastened of the Lord, that we should not be condemned with the world. And so he said to us in the scripture, if we confess our sins, he's just and faithful to forgive us all our sins and cleanse us from all transgressions and iniquities. Even now, take this moment to ask him for forgiveness, to ask him to cleanse you with his blood one more time. Even now. Do it now. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. Surely he bore our sorrows and by his stripes we are healed. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. Surely he bore all our sorrows. And all our pain, and by his stripes, we are healed. He was wounded for our transgressions. 
he was bruised for our iniquities. Surely he carried our sorrows and by his stripes we are healed. Achen chaleinu nasa Surely our sicknesses he carried, wrote the prophet Isaiah. And the King James had declared, surely he bore our sorrows, our griefs and our sorrows. The Hebrew says, Achen chaleinu nasa. No, it's not just grief he carried, it's diseases. That word sorrow in Hebrew means pain. Your pain he took upon himself. Lift up the bread to him. Take our bread. We ask you, take our lives. We love you. Take our hearts, O oh Father, we are yours. Take our bread, we ask you, take our life, we love you. Take our hearts, O oh Father, we are yours. We are yours. I beg you, Lord, take our bread. We ask you, take our lives. We love you. Take our hearts. Oh, Father, we are yours. We are yours. And now this bread, you said to us in the scripture, take, eat my broken body, broken for you. I thank you for your presence. I thank you for your substance. Let your people partake now, Lord. They become one with you, united with you. I give you praise. I give you praise. I give you praise. Shh, just a moment, brothers. Jesus. Jesus, can I tell you how I feel? You have given me your spirit. I love you so, Jesus. Jesus, can I tell you how I feel? You have given me your spirit. I love you so. My peace I give unto you. It's a peace that the world can.
cannot give. It's a peace that the world cannot understand. Peace to know. Peace to give. My peace I give unto you. Just follow me, Bruce. My love, that's what he said to us, I give unto you. It's a love that the world cannot give. It's a love that the world cannot understand. Love to know. Love to give. My love I give unto you. My joy I give unto you. It's a joy that the world cannot give. It's a joy that the world cannot understand. Joy to know. Joy to give. My joy I give unto you. You gotta feel that only strong here. My life, he said, I give unto you. It's a life that the world can never give. It's a life that the world cannot understand. Life to know. Life to give. My life I give unto you. Now lift up that bread, say, dear Jesus. Say, dear Jesus, thank you. Thank you for giving me your life. Your broken body. Broken for me. Oh Lord, even now, let your sweet presence become so real in my life. Communion. Union now with you. As I partake, I thank you for taking my sins on the cross of Calvary, taking my place, my death, all my sins, all my darkness. Thank you, Lord. And now, I partake you, your life, your body. From this day forward, I want to know union with you daily, always, in your name. Now I partake by faith. Amen. I give unto you it's a love this world will never understand love to know 
love to give. My love I give unto you. Now I, my peace and my joy I give unto you. It's a joy and a peace the world cannot give. It's a joy and a peace they'll never understand. Peace and joy to know. Peace and joy to give unto you. I lift your hands to heaven. I lift the cup to heaven. My life, he said, I give unto you. It's my life that the world cannot give. It's my life that the world cannot understand. Life to know. Life to give. My life I give unto you. Now everyone say, Dear Jesus, with all my heart, I thank you for your precious blood shed for me on Calvary's cross. Forgive me, cleanse me, wash me, sanctify me with your blood. Make me clean, make me whole, empower my life to serve you, to love you, to follow you all the days. Everyone stand as you hold the cup in your hand. We're going to worship with hallelujah. And you partake when you're ready. But make sure you're done by the third time we sing and worship. Because this moment is intimate. This moment is precious. This is your moment with the Lord. This is your moment alone with God. This is the time you tell Him your deepest desires and deepest hungers. And Bruce, just a heavenly sound. Not the strings, just a heavenly sound. As we worship, hallelujah. And then you partake of the cup when you're ready. When you're ready for that moment with God, with Jesus' his Son. And then receive your healing. Receive the infilling of the Spirit. Receive your deliverance. Receive that peace that passeth all understanding.
There's miracles happening already here, saints. on the first day of the week very early in the morning they came unto the sepulchre bringing the spices which they had prepared and certain others with them and they found the stone rolled away from the sepulchre and they entered in and found not the body of the Lord Jesus it came to pass as they were much perplexed that about, behold, two men stood by them in shining garments, as they were afraid and bowed down their faces to the earth. They said unto them, Why seek ye the living among the dead? He is not here, he is risen. Now lift your hands to the risen Lord and begin to bless him in the Holy Ghost. I command every disease to leave this house. I command every disease to leave this auditorium, this studio. I every disease to leave every life in Jesus' name, watching me across the world on TV. Right now, Lord, social media, in Jesus' name, be made whole. Be made whole. Be made whole. In the mighty name of the Lord Jesus, be made whole. This miracle is happening now. Those of you sick in body, place your hands on that sickness of yours. As I pray that sickness will go in Jesus' name, I command that disease to go. I command that sickness to leave your body. I command that disease to leave your life. In Jesus' mighty and powerful name, be gone, be gone, be gone, be gone. In Jesus' mighty name, be healed, be healed. Be healed now in Jesus' mighty name. Just once again, Bruce, Alleluia. Now lift your hands and receive as we worship. Hallelujah. Be made whole now in Jesus' name. A neck injury has just been healed. A right hip has just been healed. A skin condition has just been healed. A lung injury, a lung injury has just been healed. I give you praise, Lord. Sinuses are being healed. 
Headaches completely gone in Jesus' name. Somebody's spine has just been healed. Jesus, I give you praise. Jesus, I give you praise. Jesus, I give you praise. Shh. Jesus, I give you praise right now. I give you praise. I give you praise. I give you praise, Lord. Keep worshiping. Keep worshiping. Keep worshiping. Keep worshiping, people of God. Keep worshiping, people of God, right now. There's a tremendous anointing flowing here. An, an anointing flowing through here. Pick up the key quickly, 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 quickly. Hallelujah. Arthritis in somebody's hand has just disappeared. That pain is gone. A number of you felt that, that anointing go through your body earlier during communion. Some are, are, are feeling it now. That anointing on you is that healing power of God flowing through your body. Anyone that feels that anointing for healing, begin to check out the problem. You'll see it's gone. Begin to move your neck or your legs or your arms. Bend down, touch your toes. Do what you were, you were not able to do. Breathe in. Take that deep breath you were not able to take before. That blood disease way up there has just been healed. Somebody has been weak because of your blood, your blood, your blood. You just felt like something warm go right through your body. You felt something hot go through your body. That's the part of God. That somebody else that felt that heat also for your spine. Jesus, I give you the praise. 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 Everyone, 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 everyone begin to pray out loud in the Holy Ghost. Come on, come on, come on. Pray out loud in the Spirit. Pray out loud in the Spirit. I give you praise. You feel that anointing on you. You feel something flowing through your body. If you felt that earlier, quickly get out of your seats and come stand here to the left. Anyone that felt or feels the anointing for healing. Some of you felt like heat. Some of you felt like electricity. Some of you felt like a vibration go through your body. Some just knew and know right now you're healed. Like that woman with this, your blood. She just knew she was made whole. Quickly, 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 quickly. If God is touching you or the Lord has touched you earlier in the service, some of you were healed while I was preaching. Some were healed while we took communion. If you felt that anointing come on you, whether during communion or just the last few minutes, get out of your seat and come line up here to the left so you don't lose that healing. Whether I pray for you or not, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. What matters is you come stand in that line. Let God see you in that line to affirm your healing, to affirm your healing. Everybody lift your hands and keep praying out loud in the Holy Ghost. That healing anointing is flowing all over, all over, all over the studio. You in your homes, you call that number on the screen. Or you send me an email, Pastor Benny, Bennyhin.org. Pastor Benny, Bennyhin.org. You send me that email telling me you've been healed. Or call that number on the screen. But those in this studio, you come and stand over here quickly. That neck injury earlier, completely gone. That spine healed. That skin condition healed. Dear is Jesus, I give you the praise. I give you the praise. I give you the praise. That stomach condition. Somebody been having trouble. A lot of troubles with your stomach. A lot of pain with your stomach. I don't know what's wrong with you. All I know is you felt heat go right through that stomach a little while ago. In fact, right through your body, and the pain is gone. That whatever was wrong, if if you if you test it out, you'll see it's gone completely. I don't have to call out your healing. I can't call every healing out. But when God heals you, you just come and stand there because you'll know it. You just come out of your seat and stand here. You'll know it. What happened to the, to the, to the young lady? She had fibromyalgia 27 years. All symptoms gone. And that was the hip that you called out. Arthritis dear for... Jesus, dear Jesus. People of God, lift your hands and pray in the Spirit. Come on. Bring her up. Bring her closer here. Bring her closer here. There's other healings taking place here. The other, the, 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 there's somebody with, uh, with, with, with severe arthritis that just began a few months ago in your body. You've been wanting to go to the doctor, but right now you feel something on your body. That's the part of God. For just a few more minutes, keep praying in the Spirit. Every bit of that goes in Jesus' name. Every bit of it goes in Jesus' mighty name. Somebody on my right here has been having troubles with your knee. Somebody right over here has been having troubles with your right knee. What happened to the, to the young man there? He yeah. had a problem with his left foot, and as you were praying, the power of God hit him. The pain completely left dear him. Dear Jesus, dear Jesus, dear Jesus. Take your seats a minute. Take your seats a minute. Help him up. 
Every bit of it, every bit of it, every bit of it, every bit of it. Bring him closer here on the carpet. Lord, don't forget that little girl. Keep praying for that little girl over there. Stretch your hands and pray for the little girl over there. You are the God that healeth me. You are the Lord, my healer. You sent your word and healed my disease. You are the Lord, my healer. Just one, one more time. Shh, 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 shh. You are the God that healeth me. Sing it with me. You are the Lord. You sent your word. Help her up. You are the God. You are the Lord. Your daddy. And he. I know you are able. Shh. I know, my Lord, you're able to carry her through. For you healed the brokenhearted and you set the captives free. You made the lame to walk again, cause the blind to see. You are able, you are able. Somebody carry that baby for the mother. You are able. Just for a moment. I know, my Lord, you are able. Carry me through. James, come here. You healed the broken-hearted. Set the captives free. <sighs> you cause the blind to see that anointing is here. You are able. You are able. I break that curse over this family. Shh, shh, shh. I break that curse that was placed by that woman in your own. Break it. healed the broken hearted set the captives free you made the lame <laughs> he's on the woman you 
You are able. You are able. The broken hearted set the captives free and made the lame to walk again, caused the blind to see. The Lord is showing me that uh, this cancer came because a woman gave put a curse on you from your family. When you converted, I see a woman with a black scarf who put a curse on you for leaving your religion. I broke it. The Lord said to me, pray for him first. When I laid hands on you, something happened to her. I declare your girl will live. You know who the woman was? I see a woman. Five, seven, full face, full cheeks, black scarf, black robe, a member of your family. I see a picture in her, in her room of one of the imams, known imams. A big picture. I'll whisper it in your ear. She's free now. You, you, you felt something break when I laid hands on you. What did you feel? Huh? I'm just shivering. I don't know what's going on. God broke it. Help him up. All, all of you stretch your hands. In fact, stand up. Under this anointing, I declare her healed. I declare that brain cancer is gone. I declare the curse is broken and I apply the blood of Jesus on her. I apply the blood of Jesus on her mind. I apply the blood of Jesus on her brain. She shall live a long life. 
the effect of the curse is broken in Jesus name it's not often that I feel what I felt I was in I think New Orleans Louisiana years ago and a man came to the platform with cancer and the Lord told me there was a curse on him when we broke it the curse left but when you have a child you always deal with the parents biblically always with the parents and the Lord said lay hands on the parents and break the curse he's still feeling it I saw a woman I told your husband what picture she had in her home she's a member of the family when you left your country I don't want to say what what you told us earlier she put the curse but I broke it now every day I want you to do something I want you to play and I'll give it to you if, you, if I have to but you can download I want you to play the scriptures while she's asleep because the devil will try to come back you keep it away with the Bible or play worship music but the scriptures are much stronger than worship music because it's God's word and every week till her healing is complete now it's been broken you have to understand this is spiritual here if this was a physical problem it'll be a different matter altogether but when it's spiritual those devils don't like to be gone too long so every week I want you to have communion in your home and I promise you on the Word of God the cancer will never come back Will you go to mommy or daddy come on somebody say hallelujah. hallelujah bless you Lord no I didn't do anything it's 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 the Lord who did it but I want you to do what I told you and after service you come talk to me a little more because I have a few more things to tell you that I cannot say publicly take take your seats wow you are the God that healeth me. One year ago, this woman was diagnosed with lupus. You are the and Lord. tonight she says she believes that she's healed in her body. My healer. You sent your word. Healed my disease. Who's, who's the man there? Oh, come, come. Come with her. So what was wrong with you? I suffered so many years. Body ache. And, and I went, the Lord um, told me to look in my office and I found a paper that said my, AL, my ALT was abnormal and it said lupus, notified patients of lupus. I didn't, I don't remember. So I took it to my doctor about a year ago and they've been, I've seen my neurologist. They've been giving me medication. I just knew my healing was going to. What happened tonight? I just felt the anointing of God upon me. So powerful. And I brought my mother today because the doctors diagnosed her with cancer. Where, where, where's your mom? There. Let her, let, let her come down and I so got, I can pray for her. And I got my healing too. I just, I'm so in love with the Lord. I'm just so in love with him. Of course you are. You are the God that healeth me. Oh, that's precious. You're the Lord, my healer. Let the mother come. You sent your word. Can you pray in the Holy Ghost this minute? I want to pray for the mom. I'm going to dis dismiss you in a few minutes, so stay with me a few minutes. Stretch her hands to his mom and pray that God will get the cancer out of her. You are the God that healeth me. 
Heal the Lord, my healer. Closer. Bring you closer. Sent your word. You feel that anointing, don't you? Heal my disease. You're the Lord. What do you feel on you? What do you feel on you? I can't explain it. Can't explain it. You are the God. God is healing the whole family tonight. Pardon? She was supposed to start chemo in two weeks, and I believed, and I said, no, Mom, God's going to heal you. I believe it, and we brought her here, and I received my healing. I know in the name of Jesus she is healed. I know it. Her pastor's not here. Help, help, help the, the daddy up, uh, the, the husband. Where, where, where was the cancer? Come here to look closer. You are the God that healeth me. You are the Lord. Dear God, I feel the only for her. I rebuke it in Jesus' name. The cancer leaves her body now. You sent your word. She's feeling something. Pick her up. Healed my disease. You feel that warmth on there? You feel the warmth? Describe it. I can describe it. I, I just feel the anointing, the, the presence of God. Yeah, of course the presence of the Lord is here. Did you have pain? Did you have pain? You had pain when you came? A little bit? Check it out. You don't feel no more. Well, that anointing is strong enough to kill anything. Now, you take your mom to the doctor. I think that thing is gone. Oh, I know, so I can feel it. Help her up. Lady, I declare you whole. In Jesus' name. Now, now do, 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 do something that would, would cause you pain prior. Oh, you had surgery there? Well, try it. I feel better. No more pain. Praise the Lord. Aren't you glad you came? Where did you uh, come from? Pardon? Victorville, California. How far is that from here? High Desert, <laughs> San Bernardino. It's a long way. I better dismiss you all. <laughs> what, what happened to the young man? He was healed of over four years of tinnitus in his right knee tonight. Come here, kiddo. Thank God he healed you. Come on, he says, yeah. Father, I thank you for that anointing on him. Use him in the mighty name of Jesus. Ah, there it is, brother. I want you all to stand. Come on. Help him back to his seat. I want you, before I dismiss you, I want you to make a commitment that weekly you're going to have communion in your homes. If you can't, at least every two weeks, but no less than once a month. Amen. Father, bless your people. Go with your people. Increase your people. In Jesus' mighty and glorious name. Let this be the greatest season of your life. Rejoice in the Lord. Be strong in Him. And serve Him with all your life. And your heart and strength. Wow. Wow. Would you stretch your hands up like this? You're going to feel heat come on your hands. You are the God. You are the God that healeth me. You're the Lord. 
my healer. I hear the Lord telling me that to tell the people the promise, to remind you of the promise, they shall lay hands on the sick and the sick shall recover. And a number of you feel heat on your hands right now while I'm talking. If you feel heat, just wave your hands. Well, now go do your job. Go do your duty. Go lay hands on the sick and see him heal. I'm feeling real hot on my left hand. Like heat just took hold of my palm here. If you feel it, really feel it, just say, I do. Now, this is a sign that we ought to go do our job. No doubt in my life, no doubt in my heart or life that a great revival is coming to this country. And just before I wanted to dismiss you, I started feeling this, this heat on my left hand. Guys, lift, lift your hands. You're going to feel it even get deeper on you. You feel it deeper? What do you feel like? What? Just one hand or both hands? Both. You feel both hands like hot, like real hot or what? It's a, so it's a soothing heat. That's... Well, you, you are missionaries, you ladies. You go to Mexico and everywhere God is going to use you. Wow. You and your homes be blessed with the healing anointing on your life. And Jesus said, go in my name, preach the gospel, cast out devils, lay hands on the sick and they'll recover. Now, I just feel to do this. I don't know why, but I really feel something is about to break loose in the next few days in the world. Can I keep you for only two minutes? Bibi Netanyahu just won the re-election. That's significant prophetically. And I don't have a lot to say about this, but I want you to do something for me, all of you. I want you to come back on the 29th because May 2nd I leave. So May 2nd is a few days after that. I really believe God wants me to do this. Now, I think I did that a few weeks ago. If I recall, maybe I didn't do it. I don't remember. I want to lay hands on everyone that comes that night. And I want to pray that God will grant every need in your life to be met before the end of the year. And I want you to give me your prayer requests, and I'll not do it for anyone else except you and you that are watching. I'll take your I want to take your prayer requests with me to Israel. I'm going to go to the wailing wall. Leave it with the rabbis. I've never known God to refuse a prayer prayed in Jerusalem. And they're going to take your prayer requests and bury them on the Mount of Olives. That's what they do, by the way. They take all those prayers out of the wall, bury them for good, for life, on the Mount of Olives. You people didn't know that, but that's a fact. Some of those rabbis in there, I know them. They know me. I'm taking with me Danny Ben-Gigi, who is Messianic. And we're, we're going to do something I've never done before. I may take your prayer request with me first there. On Mount Carmel, the exact spot where Elijah called far from heaven. Today is a community of believers, Jews and Arabs, Holy Ghost people. I'll be with them. I'm going to meet with them. And we're going to do some programs with them. Wouldn't it be wonderful if I take your prayer requests and have all of them lay hands on your prayer requests? In the same spot where Elijah called far from heaven. But I'm not going to do it tonight. You have to come back in two weeks. Or a week and a half, in fact, to be exact. This is Friday. Monday's coming up. The Monday after. It's the 29th. What date is it? How many like to come back? 
then you need to call us. Tell us you're coming back. We don't have to call you. And Lori, I don't know what Lori is, but she's somewhere there. Uh, you, you, you know what you could do even? You can just send us an email that you're coming. That's easy, all right? You don't even have to call. Just send us an email. And that night, I want to lay hands on everybody. And then you're going to give me your prayer requests, and Tim and I and others are going to go and be with Pastor Chris in Jerusalem. And while there, we're going to do a telethon, which you'll all see live here, and there'll be other people here while we're there. But one thing I'm determined to do is go with Danny ben, ben Gigi up to Carmel and meet with those believers. And then we're going to do something very, very special. They just, there's new things happening now at the Wailing Wall, under the Wailing Wall, that I want to go visit for the first time. Quite interesting what's going on. So may the Lord bless you and keep you. Make his face shine on you, lift up his countenance on you, give you peace. And God's people said, Amen. don't ever forget, he's holding you up look, looking at you. Huh? So the Lord is risen. The Lord is risen. Good night. Bye-bye. See you in a week and a half.